Well, this is uh, coming here and being able to stand up here and look at you and share has been a long time coming. I mean, like years coming. I want to make a couple of comments on Melissa's testimony, uh, just so you could appreciate the miracle that took place. Melissa had effectively shut down everybody. She wouldn't listen to me or anybody else. It's not like there wasn't men of understanding that couldn't open this up to her. I'm sure there were. She wouldn't listen, okay? She had to be reached from the inside. This was a miracle that took place within her. She read the scriptures. I'm going to tell you, she read the scriptures and the, the Bible because of her heart just became a living thing. And, and, and it just led right there to Jesus. Praise the Lord. Uh, if I were to just cut away the non-essentials of my testimony, and if I were just to boil everything down to one sentence, it could be summarized as, once I was blind, but now I see. And incidentally, brethren, I was born blind. And whoever heard from the beginning of the world a man who was born blind being given his sight? And it's a wonderful truth to see, see, that God does give sight to the blind and he freed the captives. You know, uh, being here, is, uh, it's just so many things have happened and just being here has just been like a tremendous thing. I, can't believe we're here. Uh, when I look around and I observe the many things that God has done for the family, and when I listen to all the wonderful and marvelous things he, he has done in different stories I've listened to and, 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 and been a part of, I feel, I, really, I feel like a child when I get up here and say that God, can, God surely can do everything. He can. God can do everything. And surely God does do everything. Everything flows from God. Out of God is everything. Uh, he is the cause for everything we have. He is personally responsible for revealing himself to us. Uh, God has given each one of us a brain, very functional. And he's given it to us to fully consider and contemplate the majesty of him, of God. And we need to engage our minds and we need to encourage others to engage their minds for this purpose to contemplate God and to, you know, muse and think about God. Uh, like I said, that uh, God is, uh, he's, he's responsible for revealing himself to us initially. As you remember, in the garden, it wasn't but a short period of time, and that after the fall, that uh, barely anyone knew God at all. They had uh, forgotten all about God. And uh, I think someone told me that in seven short generations, that man had become so wicked, God had to destroy the face of the earth. Seven generations, God had to destroy the earth. And then, you know, uh, it doesn't surprise us. That's the nature of flesh. Flesh is dead to God. It has no recognition of God. It has no realization that God is there. And so, you know, I say to you, in this dead, in this dead condition, man didn't come to any uh, 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 assumptions about God. In this dead condition, man didn't just figure all this out. God had to uh, reveal this to him. God is responsible for the divine plan, plan to redeem mankind. God has provided absolutely everything a man needs to be free. In the kingdom of God, among men, where God is working out his eternal purpose, it's been his good pleasure to allow man to be co-participants and co-partners with him. And they are referred to the called out ones, those who have been called out by Jesus to the Father, have been allowed to participate with Him. And Jesus calls us, and He continues to call us up, up higher into the heavenly places where uh, we can see that uh, this call of Jesus is like a progressive thing, that it just continually calling us upward and higher, even out of this world. And brothers, we do this by faith. Uh, I have some things I want to share with you, and this is a verbal testimony. Um, the things that I say are intended to recommend God to you based on what he's done in my life. Uh, this testimony serves as evidence for what God has done. 
You know, I get up here and I say with words as a testimony, actually our lives are walking and living testimonies of the power of God. Uh, I, I want, there's two primary things I want you to see in this, in this uh, testimony. First of all, I want you to see that God is utterly faithful. When I get through, I want you to, I want you to be able to realize God is faithful. And he's been faithful to me. And I hope I can bring this out to you. Uh, God is faithful. And he never does. He always does what is right. He never does what is wrong. Secondly, uh, this testimony can also be seen as a sort of kind of like a report on the modern church. Uh, if you can entitle a, a, a testimony, I entitled this one, Searching for God. In Acts 17, 26, uh, God has from one blood, it says, Paul says that to, through the Spirit, that God has from one blood created all men everywhere. He has strategically placed them about the earth, determining their boundaries and pointing the times in which they live in view of or in hopes that they might find God. And then the Spirit makes a critical point about saying that even though he's not very far from each and every one of us. Um, so we see from that that the sole purpose of man is to pursue God and to look for God. That's, that's a primary occupation of man is to pursue God. Um, the scripture says here that God determined and God appointed. So um, the main point is that God rules because he and he alone determines and uh, determines the place and appoints the times. Um, as I review the past years of my life, I see them as all revolving around this one thing. It was a pursuit for God. Uh, my entire life has been simply a struggle. It was simply a struggle. It was a struggle to find God. Um, this lifelong struggle has led me through all kinds of experiences, and I wanted to share a few, with, a few of them with you. Now, the only reason I share any of these things with you is so that you could more fully appreciate what God has done, the results. A lot of these things nobody knows. I share them with you because we're family. I was born in 1953. My earliest recollections of going to church was probably about around six or seven years old. My parents started at that time to go to church. We hadn't been going anywhere. Uh, our family was influenced by friends. We were going to a Baptist church. Um, we met there for seven or eight years until the, the, uh, the church split. Um, I, don't, I didn't know anything about the church splitting then. I just realized that we had quit going. Uh, during those years, though, I remember being drawn to God. And all the things I learned about God, I eagerly accepted and believed. I had no trouble believing in God and that he existed was no real pride. I, I eagerly accepted that. I had no trouble in that at all. That God existed and that he created everything made perfect sense to me, and it still does. Uh, I can remember as a child and a teenager, my heart was drawn to God uh, in the story of the cross. Uh, although, even, even back then, I can remember uh, I had trouble making connections because, you know, I had observed that there was a difference between the behaviors of people on Sunday and the rest of the week. I just couldn't make that connection. Uh, I wanted every day to be like Sunday. Uh, I wanted to think all week long like I did on Sunday. <laughs> I see some people smiling about that, but you know what I mean. Uh, even today, it's not uncommon for people to express that same sentiment. You can, you, I've heard people say, well, you know, when I'm reading the Bible, everything is good. But, you know, it's, when I get away from the scriptures and everything kind of seems to gravitate back to the normal. Or when I'm at church, I feel real good about church and being uh, surrounded by the, the, uh, everything at church. I feel real good. But then Monday morning, when I go back to work, everything's kind of like it's back to normal. And uh, this very thing, not being able to make that connection and, uh, between, you know, the, the faith life and the church life had become... A, extreme, a source of extreme anxiety for me, and this was continued for some time. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the local congregation, the Baptist church split, and my parents were really devastated about all of this, and they quit attending. 
It, uh, we were not going anywhere. I, my uncle approached a family about growing with, going with him to a Christian church across town. This is a Central Christian Church that we were talking about, Brother Bill, the other day. Uh, so we, uh, it was an instrumental. We, uh, they started going there. I was about 17 years old, and quite frankly, I was not interested in going to church. I had uh, derived no benefit from going to church at the, until this time. I had gotten anything from it. I was really interested in it at all. Uh, my, my parents was all gone home about going, but uh, I didn't want to go. You know, the, the church tells you that uh, you, uh, the more you put, when you hear people say like the church will tell you, you say, well, you only get what you put into it, which is a valid kingdom principle. But that's not what they meant. They mean you need to be doing more, okay? And so um, I, I didn't go with them, and uh, I, this is uh, it's a kind of a natural thing to do to lose interest and these kinds of things, maybe if I refer to them like a Christian, uh, a Christian sy uh, system, uh, it's, it's like a void, and uh, you don't see any benefits in them, you lose interest. And this was the uh, time period was uh, the late 60s. You remember those were the days of the hippie and would uh, move right into the Jesus movement. And the Jesus movement, was a movement of a great many who had to reject the establishment, along with this, the traditional church, um, which I had also rejected. One day, I came into possession of a uh, magazine. It was shiny and glossy and had a picture of Jesus on the front cover. It was called Jesus Christ, Solid Rock. I perked right up. It uh, was written by David Wilkerson, Salem Curban. I think Hal Lindsey wrote some things in there. And uh, it dealt strictly with the end times and the imminent return of Jesus. Uh, it got my attention, and it was primarily responsible re with refueling in me a renewed interest in Jesus Christ and him alone. Uh, I need to make uh, this comment here that uh, although my mind was oftentimes about the Lord, all the time I thought about him, I hadn't forgotten anything I had learned, but I was living in the world. I, I belong to the world, but I was still sensitive to uh, all the things about Jesus. The message of Jesus returning has stirred in me a great desire to once again try to establish a connection with him. I knew by then, though, that the church was going to be of no profit to me. I knew that the world and the ideas about living in the world was going to be an obstacle. I already, I've already learned that. So I knew that this was something I was going to have to do. So with much prayer and scripture reading, I approached God and God alone. Personally, I did this. And uh, I did the things I needed to do. I, it was natural for me to understand. I needed to disconnect from the world. I don't know why Christian folk had such a problem with this. Really? You know? I mean, you got to disconnect from the world and turn it loose. Uh, anyway, I did that. And... Uh, this was my senior year in high school, and uh, that was in the early 70s, and the fourth integration of two races was taking place in Savannah, Georgia. They were lagging behind. The state of Georgia uh, forced that on them, and uh, it was a bad time, and it was such a discouragement to me that I just decided not to go back. All this was happening at the same time, so I just quit going. For the first six weeks of school, I, I didn't go. I just quit. Uh, when I decided to return back to the Lord, though, I, I realized, I said, you know, I need to get back in school and get things straight, you know. So uh, that's what I decided to do. I, uh, in my all-out effort to connect with God, I decided I need to return to school. And so what I did, I took a New Testament Bible, stuck it in my front pocket, and I rolled up that new, that uh, Jesus Christ Lord Rock magnet, I stuck it in my back pocket, and off I went. And uh, they started, you kind of have to go see the principal. So I went to see the principal, and he told me, he said, uh, technically, he said, you've already missed too many days to graduate. But he sat and listened to me as I told him the reason I was coming back to school. And he said, well, he said, uh, I'll tell you what. He said, if you'll uh, not miss any more days and pass, pass all your classes, I'll graduate. And he did. I graduated in 1972. Uh, the days were so bad at school, though, I had to spend most of my time sort of kind of in the Word. So I read the Scriptures all the time, and in my spare time, I tried to convince others about Jesus Christ. 
I'd use the New Testament scriptures in uh, my magazine, and I went around to uh, different people that I could approach, and I talked to them about Jesus. This is what I did. Uh, I started going to the Christian church with my family. This was my first exposure to the Christian church uh, with its strong emphasis on baptism. As soon as I got started, they recognized that I needed to be immersed, and which was no obstacle to me. The idea of being immersed uh, was, no, was, was no real problem. Actually, I had already been immersed as a young child, 10 or 11, and, and with the Baptist. But uh, the real problem came was that uh, uh, my, uh, my good friend, who I grew up with, his daddy was a Baptist preacher. And as I look back now, he was more familiar with the teachings of John Calvin than he was Jesus Christ. But he told me, he said, hey, you don't need to be baptized. The Christian church told me I did. It got to be a real thing. And so uh, I knew that whatever decision I made was going to determine which group I was going to associate with. So I finally, I, it, it got to be such a thing that I told them both that um, I didn't want to hear it. So I, I quit discussions with both groups, and I decided to, uh, to study the thing for myself and to come to a conclusion on my own. Uh, I didn't really understand all the implications at the time about being immersed. Uh, I didn't trust anybody. On, it was a sensitive issue. I didn't trust anybody on either side. I felt in my heart I wanted to be immersed again to make sure that I fully complied in every way. So I submitted to be immersed by Tim Hudson sometime my senior year. So my, my aggressive behavior for the Lord continue, continued, and eventually I was considered radical and extreme. Even though I didn't consider myself radical or extreme, and by the same token, I didn't even consider that the others were uh, casual and disinterested. I guess that's why I seem so radical and extreme. Uh, but anyway, my, the way I was, was I was out of absolute necessity. I was determined not to let this slip, you know, out of my hands. So I had to be aggressive about it, you know, kind of like violently, you know, take it. And uh, I was desperately trying to connect and stay connected. So far, no one, and even I was in the Christian church too for some time, so far, no one had declared to me the nature of the faith life. No one had opened up to me about the new man or the transforming power of God. I didn't have the slightest notion of the new covenant, what being born again really meant. God's eternal purpose was like absolutely foreign to me. The struggle between the old man and the new man well, it hadn't even been addressed at all. Our eternal inheritance in Jesus Christ, God's eternal purpose, none of these things. I had never heard of them. However, before I had graduated from high school, people were already talking to me about the full-time ministry, which I didn't understand. I didn't even understand. I didn't stop to consider that there was a part-time ministry. You know? So I, they said that uh, I was slated for the full-time ministry, and that the full-time ministry was the right thing for me to do because all serious-minded people committed to the Lord in this way was to go into full-time ministry. The youth group leaders took me to Atlanta Christian College with that, where I met with so many people. Uh, actually, they reminded me, and I ain't trying to be uh, uh, negative, but they reminded me of a huge youth group you know, somewhere. And so I enjoyed it. I came back. Um, after high school, I began to work. All my spare time I spent over at the preacher's house, Tim Hudson. I didn't have any uh, young adult friends and, and uh, of people who um, I could meet with. I was so much different from everybody else. I had to stay at the preacher's house and talk to him. Tim Hudson started to tell me that you don't need to go to Atlanta Christian College. Although he graduated from there, he said, uh, there's, he told me about a new college in Bluefield, West Virginia. Tim said, I know the college president personally, David Branholm. I followed Tim Hudson up there and I turned 19 years old in Bluefield College of Evangelism. Bible College was not at all what I expected. Most of it wasn't even about the Bible. 
Uh, at Bluefield, the main thrust was on preaching, and the curriculum was focused on men in particular with a heavy emphasis on public speaking. The title of our textbook was Speaking as Listeners Like It, and the author belonged to this world. I, I'm not sure, but I think it's a textbook which was popular at Roanoke Bible College. David Branholm was a graduate from there, and I think he brought the book over. It took me some time to figure out the Bible College was not so much interested in spiritual growth as it was in making preachers. Uh, I had no idea at the time that professional religion has always been an enemy to spiritual growth. I, I didn't make that connection. Now, a lot of connections I hadn't made at this time. Uh, I had no idea that really, essentially, I had been introduced to a different Jesus. Well, anyway, I figured that uh, this was a, a, a good idea, the professional ministry. Well, that's fine, but I didn't want to be a part of it. I thought it might be okay, but I wasn't interested in being one. After school that freshman year, that summer, uh, some friends of mine, college friends, we left and went to the Tri-City area of Troy, Albany, Schenectady, New York, and we worked in a, an already established Jesus place. We had begun one in Bluefield, and it was a, a, I didn't understand that then, but that was a real bad thing to do. They, all our brethren, perceived that as a faith-only operation. They weren't very happy with that at all. Um, at that time, we're talking about the early 70s. Um, I had heard about, along the way, I had heard about a Bible college. I, I didn't return to, uh, Bluefield. After, after that summer, I didn't go back. Uh, I had heard about another college that would allow a person to just take Bible uh, courses and study language, etc., and not get involved in a ministerial program. You could go there and take Bible courses and stuff like that. And so that was Johnson Bible College. I started there in 73, 74, uh, 77. Uh, I was there, I think I was in my sophomore, junior year. David Eubanks called me in the office. He said, um, there's a little group in Nashville, Tennessee. They want somebody to work with them over the summer. I think you could do that. I said, uh, I went there. I took the job. Uh, it wasn't but a few weeks. I realized they just went through a, a split. Uh, you would not believe. I had gathered after a while. I gathered, found out that the split was so severe, the police had to be called in to just to take control. Uh, I was astounded. Huh. Uh, I began to meet with people who were affected on both sides. This was just really out of my area. So I immediately got in contact um, uh, with others. I got in contact with some preachers from Memphis and I, I would look for uh, you know, direction and all of this. And uh, I, I immediately started uh, targeting my efforts on particular problems I had uh, seen. And a, in a, in a, anyway, in a short few weeks, the elders called and had a special meeting. I didn't know what the meeting was about. Uh, they asked me to get out of the parsonage. They, uh, I was from Georgia, and they told me that they, by the end of the week, you need to get your stuff and leave. Uh, they offered, uh, I was from Georgia, they didn't offer me any way to get back. They didn't ask me if I had a place to stay. Uh, I got out, they didn't come by to check on me. I never heard from them again, nor saw any of them again. Actually, the only person who helped me out was a man by the name of Charles Anderson. He was a retired truck driver, made watchmaker. He went to Switzerland to learn how to make watches. He didn't even profess to be a disciple of the Lord. But I had met him in, the, in my encounters going about talking to different people who had been involved in split. I met the man. He said, you can stay with us. Uh, I don't have to tell you that you know, I was pretty much had it in. I pretty much did it in for the uh, ministry, um, the local ministry. I pretty much had done it in for me. You know, uh, I look back, though. I can see why it was so important for a man when he gets into the ministry, you know, to pick himself up a wife as quickly as he can because, you know, I was by myself at the time. If possibly I had a mate, you know, someone who could uh, provide support and strength for me in these times, I might have been able to push through this. You know, but anyway, uh, I got out of that. Uh, for the next 20 years, 
time was spent, in the next 20 years, I spent time working. I spent time in retail management with Kmart. I was in the United States Army. I was married outside of Christ for 17 years. Uh, time will not permit me. I think it would be a distraction if I went into a lot of things about that. Uh, anyway, but uh, I fell off that. I fell out of the Lord. Uh, but I hadn't forgot about him. And he hadn't forgot about me either. Um, I, you know, I have observed through the years there are those who just have no desire for God. Um, I have known people to grow up, be old people, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years old, and they never make any public recognition of Christ. This has always been, even though they can see God everywhere, his thumbprints on everything, and they never make any public recognition of God. This has always been a real obstacle to me. How could anybody spend a lifetime of living and never be curious, you know, I use the word curious, even curious about the Lord or God. And uh, the American population, they tolerate Christianity like it's a good thing to do. It just makes them feel good. But then again, there are those few, they're scattered here and there, there and about. Uh, they're, um, they're distinctive. They're, they're the ones that are suffering. They're the ones that are struggling and agonizing. They're usually seen confused all over. They're scattered all about in many sectarian groups. You'll even find them in the restoration movement from here to there. They're God's people. They're those who are looking for the Lord, the true Jesus. The years I spent, about 17 or 18, were some really rough times. Uh, I had to work really hard. Uh, I had to sometimes work several jobs. My spiritual life was an absolute disaster. Uh, I couldn't seem to make any progress in my understanding. I went to church. I tried to get involved in the church. I, I had a track ministry going. And uh, I, I, would, I would be quickly uh, approached by different congregations wanting me to do this and want to get, get involved, and I would. But, you know, I, I never was able to make any connections, uh, real connections for the Lord. I uh, didn't want to get involved in the, in the Christian system, but I did want the Lord. Um, so this is the way my life generally was going. In the 90s, uh, things were looking a little better financially. Uh, kids were growing up. And then in 1999, my wife approached me one day, just right out of the blue, and she said she was moving out. She needed some space, and that uh, Gretchen, my daughter, was going to go with her. They were going to get an apartment. And she said, we're going to go over there, and I just need some time. And I said, well, hey. I said, well, look. I said, take whatever you need. Um, I'll, you know, do this and that and this and that, and I'll make all these concessions. Uh, I found out shortly that she didn't go to an apartment. She had moved in with another man and uh, filed for divorce. I didn't contest a divorce by December of that same year. We, we were divorced legally. I was, of course, devastated and personally insulted by that. Uh, I still didn't see God working. Um, I, went, I went back to school. I went to a small community college in town. Uh, my daughter was working for Arby's uh, restaurant there in town, and uh, I was going about my life. Gretchen uh, was telling me about uh, this woman manager that she worked for. Uh, she told me about this pretty woman manager she had, and she wanted me to come up and see her. And Gretchen was persistent about this, and she kept on and on and on. Like, Daddy, come on up there, and I want you to see, and meet uh, my manager. And so, well, okay. And so uh, one day I went up there, I got in the checkout line, and um, I seen this dark-headed woman up there bouncing around, you know, totally, fully in control of the restaurant, big old smile on her face. I said, oh. I got in the line and ordered. I, uh, our first date was November 2000. We dated for a year. October 5th, 2001, we got married. We had a wonderful time at everything we did. I never got along with anyone so good. I never enjoyed anyone so much. We had many good conversations concerning the Lord before we got married. This continues afterwards, incidentally. We never talked so much about denominational differences uh, in doctrine, but rather we, we primarily talked about God. We talked about the Lord and how he has chosen to uh, work in the lives of people, things like this. Then on Memorial Day 2002, something happened. And uh, it was kind of, the world would call it a reality check. That's what the world would call it. 
uh, the details of what happened would really be an unnecessary distraction. But I will describe it this way. It was a crossroad. It was a significant event. And that the way I would respond, my decision would, looking back, would have definitely altered the course of my life. Uh, it would set it like in stone and concrete. I uh, took several days off from work, contemplating on how I would react, how I would re re respond. Uh, the events that had taken place on that weekend had been directed at me personally, but they had really impacted our relationship together. Uh, during those days, my whole life just played through my mind like a slow motion movie or something. And I just turned and listened, you know, at the end of the time, and I said, I turned to her and said, Look, the world's a bad place. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that. We just got to get out of it. We got to get out of it. And, you know, she felt the same way as I did. So, we, at that time, at that single instance, we turned to God, and we have never turned, we turned our back to the world, and we haven't looked back. This turning to God was not a nonchalant or casual matter. In fact, I knew better than that. This was an absolute turning to God. It was a desperate a despair. It was an, like an abject surrender to God. The word abject has in within it the idea of utter resignation with humility. That's why I chose it. It's, uh, it's like hopelessness. And so that's the uh, frame of mind we had when we turned to the Lord. We quickly departed from the world. We sold our, all our pleasure seeking toys. And we began a most earnest quest for God together. It's been a most marvelous thing. And it's even led us here. I never thought for a moment that we'd end up here at that time. God never fails to recognize anything we think or do. He is, his eyes upon the face of the earth, back and forth, looking for people, just like us, for example. He's looking to help them. Now, Satan would have you believe that's not true. And we know he's a liar and that uh, everything he has to say is a counterfeit and it's an outright deception. We have faced many obstacles together. In the beginning, we had some serious things to work through. We together faced a difficult obstacle, the old familiar enemy of institutionalism and the dead modern church. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but me and Melissa, and Melissa and I, we probably spent several years and we visited an area of probably 50 or 60 miles. We visited with every group and we were fortunate to find maybe just a handful of people who've experienced this too, I'm sure, that had any desire or, or really any interest in the Lord. We uh, were just really distraught. Melissa uh, alluded to this earlier. This is when we had decided to look for something that was going on somewhere. I got on the internet. I was looking for ARM, prison ministry. We thought we'd become a part of that and do something. That site led me, that link led me to the Word of Truth site. It uh, was uh, a website which promoted the edification and the joy and the lifting up of the saints. When I first read it, I said, who ever heard of such a thing? And, uh, and I told Melissa, I said, I read this. You've got to read this. And we spent some time there, and we knew from that that we had found something. I, I wanted to develop in this testimony the relationship of the sheep to the shepherd. At the end of John 9, Jesus makes a keen and arousing remark. He talks about the sheep that hear his voice. Those are the sheep that Jesus knows 
They, he knows that they belong to him, but they just haven't heard his voice. They've been here and they've been there and they've heard all different kinds of voices, but they haven't responded. And it's primarily because they didn't hear Jesus. And so many people out there today are in visiting different places. They're doing this and they're doing that. And they're hearing the voice of another Jesus, an imposter, and they haven't responded. But once they hear the voice of Jesus, his sheep will respond to him. We heard the voice of Jesus, the word of truth, fellowship, and the internet ministry. We started sending for, well, I read everything I could possibly read. There's huge volumes, I, I, I'm sure you know that. The PFD, uh, PDF files, huge volumes of written uh, materials. We read all of those, mostly all of those. We started sending for the tapes. We got on the, the care package uh, thing where they, they have an envelope and they send all the recordings and all the literature. We got that for years. Um, and then we decided that we would move up there. Um, Melissa and I had decided that since there was so much interest and that actually, really, our testimony is like two testimonies in one, that actually God had took, taken us from the dunghill and, and, and led us to the grace of God and we've been experiencing that. He also gave us so much more. I can begin to explain to you, that's why I've asked Melissa to come help me, that I move, our decision to move from um, Georgia to Joplin was a, a, an, a, an added benefit. We had, um, we had, um, you've got to know this. Uh, I wanted to share these things with you because they're, uh, they're a benefit. They're going to be a blessing to you because uh, they're going to they're going to confirm to you that uh, once you step out, once you pack it up, then God will begin to act. Once you put your forth your foot forth, the waters will recede, as they did when the Israelites crossed the Jordan. Now we had moved. Uh, we were looking for a congregation to attend, and we had moved from the city where we were living, 25 miles away, and we bought a house, a foreclosure, and we bought the house, and we had decided we was going to work in that congregation. And we had, uh, we had bought a home that was cheap. We didn't want to spend a lot of money. We decided we'd fix it up. We had, it, we had really expected to spend the duration right there. So we completely redone the house, completely. I mean, absolutely everything. We t it took us a year, practically a year, to get it ready just to move into and another year or so to get it fit to live in, so to speak. It was uh, January, into January, we made our first visit to Joplin. Had, yeah. now, we had no idea we were going to visit, okay? And so we come up there to visit. And on the way back, we got right out. We, after we negotiated the traffic, we got out on outside of Joplin. I turned to Melissa, and I said, you know what this means, don't you? So we went back, and the house that we had fixed up. Now, I had fixed this house up to live in. It was just exactly like I wanted it to be. It wasn't a fancy house, but it was the way we wanted to live. And we had structured it this way. We put it up for sale. And we proceeded to move. Um, we had hired a realtor. That didn't work out. And we... Uh, we had to let him go. I want you to tell, I'm going to let you tell the next significant thing about how that um, all the houses were for sale. Okay. Um, but anyway, what Brother Tony was saying, we hired a realtor even though we said the Lord was going to sell our house for us. So when we terminated the realtor, the Lord sold the house. There was like seven houses for sale on the same, not block, but the same road that we lived on and the road next beside it there was five houses for sale and they're all still for sale so the Lord sold our house so we could move up here um, he was faithful in giving us the money we didn't we only asked the money we had in the house and in that that gave us enough money to have enough money to move here and to pay down on another house so he gave us what we needed uh, he also after we went back and we had decided to move he ended my job which was a blessing to me, but I didn't want to tell everybody at work, hey, that's the Lord's work, you know. 
So, uh, but he, there was like 75 people that were laid off at the place where I worked. There were six people working, three were laid off, and we got severance pay and unemployment and all those good things. So that helped us to be able to move. We, uh, what else? Well, I want to talk about the, uh, how that, uh, well, my mind is blank, but. The close, like the closing on the house too. We were wanting to relay these things because of it building our faith. Because one thing that I've learned is that if you act on faith, you build your faith. It, it, your faith is built by acting on it. The Lord blesses you when you actually step forth. Because until we actually took a step, we didn't get the blessing. Like, you know, we were blessed with the Word of Truth ministry, and we had been praying for fellowship, and they had been praying for us for fellowship, and we even had a little Bible study in our home. But the people in, that did meet with us, there were three ladies. They weren't really serious because when we started talking about serious things, that dwindled out. But um, when we came, finally came up here and made the decision to move, the Lord blessed us with all the things so that we were actually able to move up here even with the closing of the house. It didn't close. Both houses closed on Monday when we traveled up here. Now, Satan delayed us until the last minute so that it would take us longer to get here. That's why Monday morning we were late because um, he drug it out to the end. There were five or six people in the realty office that got there after us and closed before us, and everybody kept saying, I can't understand why it's taking so long, and we just looked at each other and we said, we know why. We had... Uh when we made our decision to come up to Joplin, we had found a home. They, the buyer, the, uh, the sellers had agreed to, buy, to sell the house on a contingency that we sell ours. And we came up here to look at the house to make sure. We drove all the way up here and we looked at the house. We signed a contract in uh, the Blakely's home. We went back. The house had been vacant for one year. We went back. We hadn't been there. So we, uh, the, the, a Friday afternoon, our, our realtor called us and said, guess what, we got a problem that uh, the seller has uh, found a buyer that's offering them full price, and you've got 72 hours to come up with a, uh, a buyer to, uh, to satisfy the contingency. This is on a weekend. I want you to know, brother, the Monday, no realtor either. We didn't have a realtor. Monday, we had a buyer for our house. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We thought it effectively shut us down. Called up here, I do one more. Called up here and was going to see about a loan for that house. The man told me, said, Mr. Parker, you're going to have to come up here and because you're going to be uh, out of a job. He said, you're going to have to come up here and work for 30 days and establish yourself before I can give you the loan. And I said, well, I said, no. I said, we're not going to do that. I said, Melissa and I, we're not separating unless it's kingdom business. And now if the Lord says so, I'll do it. I said, otherwise, we're not, coming, we're not splitting up. We're doing it together. I said, we'll just rent. So we called somebody else, got the loan. No job. So the Lord is faithful. Right. 